Um, Schaefer with one F. I have, uh, my brother-in-law is Schaefer with one F. I wonder if you are, are all related, because I used to think that was the strangest spelling. Wow. There's many spellings. I'm always <laughs> impressed when people spell it right uh, at first attempt. Yeah, well, I interviewed my brother-in-law because he's a yogi, and he's going to be on the program as well. Um, probably his episode will be before this one because I interviewed him the other week. And so when they see there's two different Schaefers, as far as we know, there's no relation. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason I reached out to you is because of, obviously, um, related to our mission, um, I have a strong interest in EMDR as well as any kind of therapeutic modalities that are maybe a little bit newer and promising for people in the trauma space. So I sent you kind of a, a little bit of a heads up of what kind of might pique my interest, but I'm also curious to obviously get a proper introduction of yourself if you want to go through your CV a little bit and give people an idea of who you are. Um, then we can maybe get into what brought you to this specialty as well. Okay, well, uh, I started out in the chemical dependency field, so I have a strong background with addiction, and for many years I did a lot of uh, teaching and um, presenting papers and doing research in that area and also seeing clients. It was a specialization area. And then, as you know, with any kind of uh, obsessive behavior or with any kind of addiction, uh, there is a strong correlation with trauma backgrounds, and so that naturally led me into pursuing more information about how to best treat trauma. And so actually about 25 years ago, I heard that the VA in Minneapolis was offering a new training, and it was called EMDR therapy. EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. And um, They haven't thought about giving that a better name yet, have they? <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a better name, but, but, but they can't do it because all of their publications, all of their... Oh, no. Yeah, it would cost way the too much money. The rebranding budget is blown out. <laughs> we yeah, can't do it. Yeah, oh, I think, I think it's just, you know, it's known worldwide, so it would be quite a shift. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, I was the kind of person that once I got my final degree, I had had enough time sitting in classroom. So I was kind of the last person on the block to want to go get more training and sit, you know, go yeah. someplace. But I heard about this training at the local VA, and I thought, this sounds really different. And I also thought, you know, the VA is is very conservative. And mm. so it's probably not just woo-woo medicine that I'm going to hear about if it's at the VA. And so out of my partnership here, of which there were three of us, I decided to go to the, f the workshop. And I believe it was the first EMDR training in the Twin Cities area. And this was, like I said, about 25 years ago. And so I went to the training and just with an open mind, and I realized that not only was it as good as they said it would be, it was actually better. And so I came back and I was really jazzed, enthusiastic, and before too long, my, both of my business partners got trained in it as well. Wow. So when you say better than you thought it would be, what was your expectation? Well, let me back up. Let's give the people, including myself, a sense of history and context. Um, if I had walked into a private practice such as this before EMDR, um, what would have been the primary intervention to try to help me? Cognitive talk therapy or, or combining that with medication or, or what would it be if well, I had like a trauma problem? You know, before and even now, even though I have this specialization in EMDR therapy, it's always multimodal. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, even though I am known for this specialization, I get a lot of referrals by other therapists who f find their clients are stuck in a particular area and they want me to just do the EMDR piece of the work. It's always multifaceted, it's multimodal, because people are all so different and people are complicated. And so even though this is one therapeutic strategy, I've always used many different strategies in my work. Some tr more traditional, some mm -hmm. less. So anyone who says, well, they're an EMDR specialist, it means they've had the training. It doesn't mean that's going to be alpha omega, the only things that they Right. I don't, the I don't you know, I think there's many paths to healing mm -hmm. and um, I, I like to say in my trainings I'm enthusiastic about EMDR, but sure. I'm not messianic about EMDR therapy. Oh, I like that distinction. I mean, the last thing you want to do, obviously we want to be upbeat and say, listen, people listening out there, uh, loved ones of people with PTSD and eating disorders, you know, don't give up if you feel like you've been through the revolving door of treatment, different therapists and whatever. We want to expose you to as many tools in the kit as possible. But we also don't want to paint a false hope that six months later you, you won't feel like you have P PTSD anymore. You know, 
It it's, really it can depends be on the level of post-traumatic stress disorder, and it depends on the number of years in that place. So for example, the research tells us with a single incident traumatic experience, and that could be a little kid being bitten by a dog where they're freaked out every time they see a dog, or it could be somebody who was held up at knife point on a, a vacation. It could be somebody who was in a car crash and can't get in their car. These are examples of single incident traumas, and the research tells us that with EMDR therapy, one to three EMDR processing sessions is what is expected to take care of that. Now those are single incident traumas. Once you get to more complicated issues, it takes longer. Mm. So the research on combat vets, for example, shows that after 10 EMDR sessions, 77% of the post-traumatic stress symptoms are gone. And even in a three month follow-up of that, that remains the case. So there can be a lot that can take place in a relatively short period of time with certain kinds of clients. The exception being, of which many of clients fall into this uh, niche, are clients who have grown up with early childhood trauma. And so I'm talking about not just abuse, I'm talking about childhood neglect. I'm talking about, if not physical abuse or sexual abuse, things like verbal abuse, emotional abuse, all of this over a period of time, those are the clients that take a good long time with or without EMDR therapy. Sometimes clients can take uh, up to years to just do stabilization and resourcing with them before they're even eligible or ready to do EMDR therapy so that it doesn't worsen the situation. Can so, you walk me through what that means before we go any further? You said stabilization, resourcing. That's stabilization uh, is, we, we talk about the window of tolerance. We all operate in life with a window of tolerance, meaning we all have ups and downs. We can handle those, we can ride those waves, and it doesn't affect in primary ways our functioning in the key areas of our life. When we experience significant trauma, where there's, especially where there's PTSD involved, we go outside the window of tolerance, and for some people that means they go beneath the window of tolerance, and that's where you see things like uh, vegetative depression, or it can be, not all vegetative depression is that, but you certainly can see that. You can see people are numbed out. Um, and if you go on the upper end of the window of tolerance, then you can see people who are highly anxious and they're gripped by their anxieties to such a degree that they can't focus even. So it's like you're almost measuring activity level, even though it activation can be level, yes, activation level, sure. And then, as you know, along with that, can they function in society, right? Right. Because you can see people who have a baseline anxiety too high to function, and then you can also picture those people who just can't feel anything anymore, like you just said. And and you talked about eating disorders, yeah. and earlier, uh, as we were talking, even before this tape began, and. Uh, people who eat in an obsessive way oftentimes do so to create that numbing to tolerate the trauma that they've experienced. So for example, if you look at studies, I'm just going to quote one of them with eating disorders, is that 63.3% of persons with anorexia in this study had a trauma background and 57.7% and, uh, of the people who had bulimia had trauma in their background. So there's a very high correlation. People eat for all sorts of reasons when they eat obsessively. One of the reasons is to numb out. And, and I'm sure you've heard that from people you've talked mm -hmm. to. And reasons to not eat. You know, I've heard that on both ends of the spectrum. Yeah. The reason to not eat is it's one way a person can maintain control in their life. It, even if it's at a cost to them, if they've lived with somebody who's been controlling them, it is one way that they can say, you're not going to control this with me. Hmm. I've heard that so many times from so many people, whether they're struggling themselves or people in your position. Um, and yet with food being such a primary, natural, regular part of everyone's life that we need to you know, have the energy to do the things we want to as individuals in the world, I, I just, I'm still trying to understand how it gets so disrupted for so long. You know, some of these people out there are battling decades later. And if when you peel back the layers, it's something that happened during their formative years. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't want to sit here and say, listen, if something happened to you before you were 10, you're basically not going to get better. But it is so much harder, isn't it? Especially before age eight. eight. It, it's just like based on brain development. Uh, before the age of eight, that's when you see if a person has experienced severe trauma, that's where dissociation begins to form. Really? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that the earlier and the more um, experiences or times or length of time the trauma occurs all factor into the healing process. So when you talk about stabilization resources, I think we jumped around a little bit. Um, what are some examples of that and what do people need to know to even maybe screen or evaluate whether EMDR might be right for them? Well, you, you lead to a very critical point in the assessment of, a, of, of somebody coming through the door to determine whether or not they're a good candidate for EMDR therapy. One of the things they have to demonstrate is that they can do what's called state change. And how we test for that is we have people imagine a safe, calm place and we light it up in their brain and how we light it up in their brain is we ask them about the visual part of it, the olfactory part of it, the kinesthetic part of it, the emotional part of it. And by doing that, we're lighting up all the different components in the brain. And then we incorporate, we can incorporate slow bilaterals because bilaterals, it's like hitting the save button on the computer. It uh, solidifies that response. And then we have them think about a minor annoyance so that here they are in their calm, relaxing place and we have them imagine a minor annoyance because as they do, their state will change. Hmm. And then we have them come back to whatever keyword or cue word they would have used to describe their safe place. Maybe it's the word joy, maybe it's the word relaxation. And once they bring up that cue word again, if they go back to that earlier state of relaxation, we know that they can state change. And then that's one of the components that we assess for before starting EMDR therapy. The other thing we assess for is one's ability to dissociate. So based on the level of trauma, based on the age in which trauma occurred, people have varying abilities of dissociating. And I th we talk about dissociation as an ability, it's a strategy. It's something we have inherent in our brain, the capacity for that. Much like our body has the capacity to go into physical shock when it's in too severe a pain, our mind has the same capacity. And dissociation could be a good example of that. So we assess for that because based on how readily a person dissociates, that's the degree to which we have to take time to do stabilization exercises, what we also call resourcing exercises. These are all sorts of strategies for calming the brain. Mm -hmm. And then we have people practice those when they're away from their sessions because as they practice them, they begin to own that and it takes less time to get into that state. And mm -hmm. I, I think about this. Myself, I uh, took up transcendental meditation at one point in my life. At age 21, I was at high risk for stroke and heart attack. And rather than do medication, I did meditation. And so at first, it would take me, you know, you do the 20 minutes twice a day, and, and I would practice, practice, practice. Well, after a while, I could get into that alpha state so much quicker. And so it was the practice of meditation that allowed me to get to that calmer brain state. Alpha, did you say? As alpha state. Alpha waves? Yeah, well, alpha and waves, that's yes. the sense of your well-being, correct? Alpha uh, waves are associated with acuity, meaning mental sharpness, but also relaxation. So it's kind of a perfect state. Sure. You're mentally sharp. You're not, you're not you know, so mellow out that you're not thinking straight, but you're calm. That seems like something that uh, I don't think a lot of people who feel disempowered by whatever trauma they've been through feel like they have the power to bring, bring that feeling on themselves. You know, mm -hmm. it can feel like that, throwing out a phrase I don't know that much about, that internal locus of control is now actually external, that you feel like whatever mood I'm in is based on whatever just happened to me, but I can't control it myself. So what you just said sounds very empowering. It is very empowering and it's a teachable skill. And it's actually a skill that I think should be taught in schools. Absolutely. Because 
everybody needs to use it from time to time or could benefit from it. it you don't have to be a, a trauma survivor in order to benefit from learning how to use resourcing or stabilization skills in order to manage activation that is, either involves anxiety or depression or other sure. things. That's amazing that you say that because uh, I can't help but think what a different world it would be if, if kids were taught in formal school studies just how to regulate their emotions. You know, it's kind of seen almost as too personal. Well, we'll teach you reading and writing, and then you have gym class and see if you survive recess. Um, but w when do we teach people, you know, you're going to be let down, you're going to be hurt, you're going to be disappointed in life, you're going to be overwhelmed, and here's what to do when you feel out of control. Where do they learn that if they're not lucky enough that their parents can teach them? Well, I suspect there would be a tremendous impact on bully behavior, meaning there would be far less of it. Mm -hmm. I think there would be a great difference in the amount of kids that are suicidal. Um, I think there would also be a great impact in our society based on the level of aggression that gets uh, displayed, whether it be road rage or carrying guns and using them on people to maintain control, mm -hmm. or whether it be abusiveness in a partnership. Sure. To name a few. Sure. Is there a movement, as far as you're aware, now you've piqued my interest, uh, to formalize that kind of, as a part of education? I'm not aware, I'm not involved enough in the education sim uh, system to speak to that, but I know that there are movements out there in terms of meditation practices that people are trying to foster um, to, to make a dent in, in this in our world, sure. which we need now probably more than many times in our life. More than ever, I'd say. And sometimes social media can be an empowering thing. You know, you see people freeing themselves from terrible situations in the third world and things like that. And then you see the online bullying and you're like, ah, oh, is it really worth it? You know, it's just almost amplifying some of the worst aspects of us mm -hmm. and how we treat each other. And there's that anonymity to where you'd say things online, maybe not you and me, hopefully, but you know, a lot of people would say things online that they would never say to someone's face. I see it. I see it on, on social media. Hmm. I, I'm always kind of surprised. I, pro I probably shouldn't be, but <laughs> it's discouraging <laughs> to, oh, yeah. to, to see some of the very hateful things that are said. Yeah, for sure. So talking about empowerment, you said there's, this, there's a skill to bringing upon this alpha state that you were talking about. Um, I imagine there are some people, because we joke about it, like, oh, calm down, count down to, from 10, think about an ocean, but you're saying it's a legitimate practice that people can develop and uh, foster in themselves and use whether they have PTSD or not. Absolutely. Um, I'm guessing that comes from uh, outside of EMDR, that this isn't the first place that it's been used. Is oh, that part no, of cognitive no, no, therapy no. since I forever? Mean, I think uh, from time immemorial, people have been looking at ways to soothe themselves, whether it's through drumming, or whether it's through nature, mm -hmm. or whether it's through music, all of which have powerful influences on a human being in terms of their state of calm. Sure. Well, we're all for drumming at the Kelly Nicole Foundation. Are we you? just ask people to use a metronome. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Stay on the click. Um, okay, so now this brings up a, a dichotomy that's fascinating to me. Um, this concept, and I know you didn't use the word distraction, but when we talk about self-soothing and kind of escaping mentally versus this concept of mindfulness, here you just brought them together. You're using mindfulness to escape and soothe yourself and kind of bring that empowerment back. Um, I'm really fascinated by... Again, I wouldn't even use the word escape because I think our natural state is to be calm. You think that's the state of nature? I, th I do. Until something disrupts us. Until we're disrupted. Huh. Until a need arises, like in the case of a baby, yeah, you know, whether it's food, clothing, shelter, change the diapers. And they scream. Yeah. Or something happens in our environment. I don't think our natural state is to be in a state of hyper alertness where our certain subcortical areas of our brain are running amok and hijacking us. That's interesting because when you say hyper alert, I might think about acuity. You know, I might think about having the quick answer to the, the question at work when someone, you know, puts me in the corner. Didn't you send this email? Didn't you do that? Or did that spreadsheet show that data? I'm like, Brrr, my, my brain is racing and I need a quick answer. Last thing I want to say is, I don't remember what I sent. Let me look at it and call you next week. But that might be the right answer, right? Yeah. Like, we yeah. want to have the quick answers in this society. 
Um, mm -hmm. You're saying that can be maybe not the healthiest state of mind? Well, I think we, we want to pay attention to how often during the day that we find ourselves in an anxious state. You know, and some people would argue increasingly that's taking place. Mm. I've, I've never been practicing during a period of time where more people have told me that purposely they have to limit the amount of things such as news, casts. It's terrible. Uh, people are really trying to keep their heads above water with hopefulness and keep their own personal anxiety at a manageable state and people are looking at all different strategies to do that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because I find more and more people I sit down with are saying what you just said, that depression and anxiety are ascending right now. Um, that they're not flat, that they're not decreasing, they're actually really, 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 people are struggling more than they ever have. I just finished watching the, the Ken Burns Vietnam documentary. Mm -hmm. Obviously being born in 1980, I only take in this information secondhand. But you see that level of loss and that level of suffering that the world is capable of visiting on people. And, and you just wonder like how, how people got through those decades, you know, whether in the U.S. or, or in Saigon or wherever. Um, but then here we are and, you know, supposedly our needs are mostly met. We're in a first world country. Unless you're overseas, it feels like we're at peace, even though we kind of never are. Mm -hmm. um, the bombs aren't here in the U.S. for the most part. Um, and yet we, f we have this sense of so many people feel defeated, deflated, despair, and just this dark cloud over us right now, you know? You're saying you're seeing a lot of that as well. I am shocked at the amount of suicidality I am seeing firsthand, and also I consult with uh, therapists in consultation groups, and the number of uh, clients they have that are either presenting suicidal ideation or who have made attempts or have executed those attempts. The, the, the amount of it is in my experience, growing at a very fast rate. Have they pinned down any kind of, I know it's hard to say, uh, you know, causality nationwide for something like that, but are they pinning down any kind of correlations? Well, the one correlation that I think people are aware of is the one with uh, addiction. You know, the opiate addiction has taken so many lives. Sure. The, the drugs are getting stronger and there's less room to error in terms of dosage. So the amount just in our community of overdoses is much higher than anybody would know because so much of it never gets reported. Hmm. Because I, it was a prescription drug as opposed to like <clears throat> a street both, drug? Both. Really? Both. Hmm. I hear about it because I hear from the people who have lost coworkers or who have lost family members and other therapists hear of it in that way, but lo most of the things I hear about never make the news. I, I would guess that there would be some report that the state might get, but um, they're not generally visible. How do, we'll get back to EMDR, I promise. I just want to build, kind of build a context for it, like what are the other things people are trying and what are pe people struggling with? Um, uh, but when someone has an, an overdose on a drug like that, how does a coroner or whoever, a medical examiner, determine what was going on in their head at the time? How do they know whether or not it was suicide? You know, as I sit here and think about it, I'm not sure how anyone would come to that determination. Well, that's a question for the coroner, I would say. Yeah. But, you know, there are some obvious signs, suicide notes. Notes, yeah. There are some signs, people on social media saying they're going to do it. There are some signs that people wrap up certain business deals. You know, there, there are certain things that I think behavioral psychologists could look at and say, right. in our best estimation, this is what happened. Indications of finality. Yeah. Things like that. Oh, that's tough. Change in behavior, you know, change in behavior ahead of time. Hmm. Doing things they wouldn't normally do, like spending money or something crazy like that? Could be that, getting out life from policies for family members. Oh, preparing. Yeah, preparing. So they look for these clues. Do you think it's underreported, though? Absolutely. How many of them are suicides? Absolutely. Yeah. Just like addiction, uh, death from addiction is underreported. Really? 
sure, it's much easier to, to tell people that it was a heart attack. And it is a heart attack when you yeah. OD on certain drugs. But the cause of that heart attack, actually, in those cases, is the drug overdose as opposed to a weak heart. Hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think that we yeah. never can really get an accurate assessment of that. That's tough. So now we've painted the picture a little bit, um, provided some context for some of the other modalities. So now someone walks through the, your door and they have a trauma background. Maybe they were very young and it is more of a persisting affliction. Um, you've worked on the stabilization. You've, you've taught them a little bit about whether you teach them meditation or mindfulness or some kind of empowerment technique. Mm -hmm. um, what's next? Well, with the person you described, that's going to go on for a long period of time, much longer. Because when EMDR therapy goes bad, there's really primarily two reasons for it. And one is not proper assessment, and the second is not taking enough time to make sure the person is capable of that state change. In other words, is having practice and being able to do that stabilization from within. So depending on their level of trauma and the years in which it took place, that could take a long time. That could take a long time. The second thing I do is I do a, an assessment. And for sure, I do an assessment for dissociative ability or dissociation. There's a specific scale I use, and I use the souped-up version of that that is more statistically proper. Uh, it's a greater predictor of dissociation. It's called the DES taxon. DES what? DES taxon. Taxon, okay. So there's a DES test that's, called, that's used for assessing dissociation. 28 items, and, and it's kind of like a real general screening. In order to create greater predictability, they've done statistical analyses of which items of those 28 are greater predictors of dissociation, and those become the critical items. And so once you figure out the critical items and you run this through a spreadsheet and you do the proper statistical analysis, you can come up with a predictive factor of how likely that person is in terms of uh, dissociating. And you're saying that in a good way or in a bad way? That they can bring it on or that it happens to them? Because uh, I'm picturing a flashback, but I might not be picturing the right thing. When you say dissociation, I'm picturing someone almost snapping and, and it's maybe not a good time for them to get away from reality, uh, well, but they have. Dissociation, one simple way to explain it is that instead of having one foot in the room, in the office where the, I'm seeing the client and one back in the memory, they have both feet back in the memory. They're and they lose okay. contact with the here and now. So that would be like, that's the kind of dissociation I'm talking about. Okay. And they don't know how to get back. Right. And so depending on their level of dissociation, it might take longer to start the MDR therapy process or not. Sometimes I also do psychological testing, MMPI, which is very good at assessing uh, factors that might contribute to greater complexity, such as psychotic behavior, addiction, uh, serious depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, those types of things. So a proper assessment is really important. Once a person you have a handle on a, a person's dissociative abilities and they are able to do state change successfully, then they are probably ready to do some EMDR processing. Uh, if it's a complicated case, if it's somebody who has had you know, extensive traumatic background, I, a lot of times we'll start with what might be a small T trauma, and a small T trauma is something that has nothing to do with the origins of their acute trauma. It might be something that, that they, um, a teacher made a comment to them and it was hurtful to them. It might be that a colleague didn't validate the work they were doing. It might be that somebody cut them off and then had fall words for them on the highway. Uh, so here and now, uh, oftentimes short uh, issues that are constrained by time, a single incident type of thing. I might start them out with that and just watch how their brain processes because that will give me more information about their ability then to go f further into more traumatic kind of material. Mm -hmm. 
So there are safeguards, like if you're trained in this and you practice the proper safeguards, um, it is a, it's a very powerful type of therapy that can be used to treat people and, and to bring some uh, order and some, some peace to people's lives. Sure. So this is a phrase that's thrown around more and more. I bet you have a lot of opinions about armchair psychologists. Everybody's a psychologist, right? Just to get through their life and have relationships and go to work and everything. We all have to size up situations and size yeah. up the people we're dealing with. Yeah. But then people start throwing around clinical phrases and everybody's diagnosing each other and diagnosing themselves and on and on. And um, it's almost become like a political thing these days on the left and on the right to use this phrase safe space. I'd like to strip away all the like street vernacular of it and bring it into this clinical setting and have you explain what does that mean, what is the purpose of it, and can you juxtapose that with the exposure concept where it's kind of the opposite of, of the safe space and you're bringing them to the danger in a way that they can reprocess it. Mm -hmm. Well, a safe space in terms of my office would be that I have worked with a client to know that they are capable of the state change. Like that's an, that's an ability or a skill set that I can work with them on so they achieve that. My office is not a safe space in the sense that safety comes from within. One sense of safety comes from within. Um, I don't expect people to trust me when they start working with me. They've probably, some of them have never trusted anybody for good reason. Hmm. But... I want to create a sense of an environment where clients are heard and they are respective and we are collaborators. I like to say, you know, I'm the choreographer, you do the dance. And we are only as good as uh, how we can collaborate with other and how well I listen to you and then respond to that material so that I'm on the same page with you. Mm -hmm. So I think by doing that consistently that creates some safe space for people to do the work they do. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like, again, with the alpha state and the empowerment talk that we were having earlier, that that contributes to a person's sense of, that sense of control and that sense of safety as well. That that's a critical factor to start doing the work where you do get closer to those dangerous memories. Yes, yes. I think it's good to clear that up just because so many people make a joke out of it these days, like, oh, all you liberals with your safe spaces. It's like, well, it's not a liberal or conservative thing, you know. I mean, the military is a very conservative organization, as you well know. Um, but the 22 vets who kill themselves every day, I feel like they deserved a safe space. They deserved a place where they could say, this is what I'm going through, and this is where I'm at, this is my plan, and I don't know how to disrupt it. And maybe someone could have disrupted it, and they could still be here, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's not a left and right thing or a weakness thing. To me, it's all about really understanding the meaning in a clinical setting. So, okay. We haven't talked yet about what the EMDR literally is, the eye movement part. Now, I remember this tripod and a machine with a bunch of bulbs left to right, and the, he could set the speed and set the eye level, you know, the vertical level of it. Mm -hmm. um, what's actually physically going on in the brain that's, that's helping people as the actual eye movement is happening? Okay, well, just to back up a little bit, uh, when you described what you just described for mm -hmm. people who aren't familiar with that, that's called a light bar, and it's one of the techniques or apparatus that is used in EMDR therapy. A key principle in EMDR therapy is the use of bilateral stimulation. And by bi bilateral stimulation, I mean both hemispheres of the brain are getting stimulated. There are a variety of ways in which that can take place. The first is eye movements. Hence the name, eye movement desensitization reprocessing therapy. But there are other ways that you can achieve that result through other forms of bilateral stimulation. One is through tactile tappers, they're called. And what that is, a little device that you hold uh, paddles and that each paddle sends out kind of a, a very nice vibration, like, almost feels like a massage. And on your hands, you hold them in one in each hand, and then the, the sensation uh, rotates. So you can use eye movements like the light bar, or you can use just simple eye movements that cross the bridge of your nose. Uh, people can do it with their hands or fingers. They can, uh, if they don't want to wear out their arm, they can use extenders such as uh, 
pointers that teachers use or pencils mm -hmm. even help? This reminds me of hypnosis almost. Like this idea that when you use the left and right hemisphere at the same time, and I don't know if the brain usually tries to use only one or if it's rare for both of them to be activated at once, but that this has a calming effect on people. Is that kind of what it is? I think it's different than hypnosis. I mean, they've, they've looked at that, um, and the state is different in sure. terms of internal state. The outcome, yeah. Um, but you asked about the mechanism. There are different theories on it. The one I favor the most is that it mimics REM sleep, and the rapid eye movement during REM sleep is innately there to help consolidate memories. And so really, through the process of EMDR therapy, we want to consult, I'm sorry, we want to um, co consolidate memory. So one of the things to think about is that when a person experiences trauma, a simple way of looking at it is as if that experience gets stuck in their brain. In other words, it's not digesting, it's not metabolizing, it's staying stuck in here and now memory as opposed to being stored in long-term memory in the form of a narrative experience. Right. And so what the bilateral movements do, the eye movements, they mimic the REM sleep and they assist in the consolidation of that memory. So it's as if it takes it out of that hypervigilant subcortical area of the brain and it moves that activation to the part of the brain that stores longer term memories. And so if you look at brain scans, because they've studied this with brain scans, what you'll see is you'll see after an EMDR session or sessions, you will see less activity in the subcortical areas, especially the amygdala, which is the danger center. Mm. And you'll see higher activation in the prefrontal cortex, and that's our thinking brain. And that's exactly what we want. If we didn't have that, a person walking in a forest who had a previous experience of being bitten by a snake might look and see on the side of their eyes uh, a long skinny branch and go into a full-blown panic attack. Sure. But with the greater activation in the executive functioning of the brain, what happens is that part of the brain can come online, it can make an assessment, it can, in microseconds, make an, a judge, judgment to determine, oh, I don't need to activate the subcortical area of my brain and put me in a panic state because that's just a, that's just a narrow stick I'm seeing. Yeah. So that prefrontal cortex that's doing the, the I guess, executive function type thinking, is that also associated with an alpha state and that, that feeling of well-being and empowerment? Or not as much? It's involved in how you process information to be able to get there, but alpha states can be produced without intent, intentionally thinking sure. about it. So, And it's there's a part of the prefrontal cortex, it's called the medial prefrontal cortex, that is especially important because what happens with trauma is some of the fibers that normally would be doing proper connections on a neurological basis to the subcortical areas they get they get they go a little haywire they don't they don't function properly mm -hmm. and so through the process of EMDR it is believed that certain neural networks that have been segregated or disenfranchised start to hook up with adaptive processing and then you be then you're in that place where you can actually make that assessment that's just a, a stick out there. It's not really anything that's gonna threaten me. For sure. Is that uh some of the EMDR desensitization and reprocessing part um trying to undo some of the associations with otherwise benign objects, like say if someone's sexually assaulted and there happens to be a red van going by, and for the rest of their life a red van freaks exactly. them Exactly. You're exactly right. And so whether it's the child who comes in with having been bitten and can't freaks out at any sound of a dog or sight of a dog, or whether it's the person who is freaked out by that van where the either the car accident occurred or the abuse took place, Yes, exactly. It's desensitizing those stimuli mm -hmm. so they no longer hold that power 
to create that panic. So what does the first session maybe entail? We talked about the light bar and setting that up. What I remember um, is a little bit of like trying to make sure it's physically comfortable, right? Is this at the eye level that you like? Is this a speed that you like? And I didn't know at the time if that was something where they wanted to give the client as much control as possible, just arbitrarily let them make decisions, or if those things really do affect um, the effectiveness of the therapy. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do th know what you're saying. And what's important first and foremost is that the client is comfortable. So, for example, if you're doing eye movements and they're too fast, you're going to probably get lightheaded and nauseous. We don't want that. You can puke. I've never had anybody puke. Wow, I hadn't I've had people talk sick. about nausea, but really? what I do, when the, if, if that should happen, what I do is I do slow bilaterals so that they get to that calm place. And so I've, you know, I've had my trash can ready, but <laughs> so far so good. This is going to get more adventurous than we expected. Um, no, I mean, I remember the work being, and I haven't done it, but uh, watching from the outside, um, want to segue into preparing people for how difficult the work is doing real trauma work um, for people who've had maybe not just a single isolated incidents, but for people who've had, like you mentioned before, people who have no reason to trust anyone. Mm -hmm. And the darkest, darkest things that people have dealt with over and over again since early childhood, those really difficult cases are kind of where my focus is with mm -hmm. the foundation. Um, because I think those are a lot of the people out there who feel like they've tried almost everything and they wonder, like, Dorothy, is there anything in that black bag for me? Mm -hmm. And I want to be the one that, that says there might be something in there for you. Even though you feel like you've tried everything and it's not working. Um, like with Cal, a lot of things, a lot of the heartache for me is that a lot of the things that are supposed to be so proven and so effective would set her off worse. Like guided meditation would send her into a terrible state of mind. Um, we were trying to do it together but she was so terrified of it because of experiences where that just would send her, she'd be in a flashback, she'd be gone, mm -hmm. and that could lead to you know, potential self-harm and other things we like that. We talk about that as contamination. So sometimes when we're trying to set up a calming place, mm -hmm. something will pop in a person's brain, and then all of a sudden what started as a very calm, relaxing place becomes contaminated, and so then we have to shift gears and use something different. Can you talk about that a little bit more um, for people who are experiencing that regularly when they're doing things that, you know, maybe they looked up on some top 10 ways to deal with your worst anxiety and they're just desperate, they're Googling things in the middle of the night. Um, contamination, what do you do? So t tell me more precisely what would be happening. Let's say someone uh, is doing some kind of a guided meditation. Maybe they have an app on their phone, I'll modernize it. Um, uh, and they're three or four minutes in and they're getting more and more nervous and now they're getting uh, intrusive thoughts and intrusive thoughts are leading to desires to self-harm as a distraction and that's leading to you know obvious the obvious fear no one wants to self-harm um, but they're afraid they're gonna fall into a flashback and if they just say okay screw you know forget this whole thing I'm not gonna meditate today then they're back to the state that they were in that made them think man my baseline anxiety is so terrible I need something but they've gone in a circle now. It made them worse. Well, if all roads lead back to contamination, then a good strategy for a safe place would be to have the person construct one in their mind that is not based in any kind of real life experience. Because with real life experiences, you always run the risk of thinking about something about that calm, safe place that then all of a sudden materializes that makes it not such. Hmm. So uh, a person can construct a place, like if you were to construct a place in your mind's eye or an imaginary place, what would be the key elements that would be important to have in that? And so a person will come up with certain things that that really can't be tainted because it's imaginal. Or they can also think about a scene from a movie that that represents that, or they can think about a time when they listened to music and felt that. So there's different ways to approach that. For sure. Sounds like, um, and this is an uplifting thing that I think Kel was inspired by, safe to say, I think I can speak for her on that one. Um, the mind's ability and tendency to heal itself 
is very powerful and we forget how, how strong we are and how powerful we are and, uh, as far as resilience, you know. Incredibly resilient and that's true physically and it's true mentally. And, you know, I see it all the time in my work and that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's the sacred part of the work. I know that there's always patient privacy, like we were complaining earlier. I was complaining about HIPAA and stopping me from some of the things I'd like to do, um, collaborating with clinics and stuff. But um, can you share any kind of you know, anonymous examples of more of the success stories? So we talked a little bit about preparation for EMDR. We talked about trauma work is very exhausting. It can be very grueling. And to be prepared for that, I think Kel had a lot of increase in nightmares when it kicked off. But she was also, I was also seeing positive things, things that used to bother her regular tactile sensations that for her were horrible triggers were starting to lose their grasp on her and I was super hopeful and excited yeah. and then we didn't know that she was also you know filled with metastatic cancer at the time so I didn't get to see that if there had been a finish line mm -hmm. um, I got to see glimpses of it though and I hold on to those um, those moments where she got to enjoy a life experience that she would have avoided for decades before that. That's pretty wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. To be able to see that, and that is so hopeful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing that keeps you going, isn't it? It is, and I want to, um, you know, in my mind I'm always playing some alternative reality where she's well, and where would this have gone? You know, would she have been able to eat more easily? And if her body had been fed, where would she have gone with her music career? And on and on and on and all these ifs. But there's someone out there right now who, who needs this answer. So can you share some more positive stories about some turnarounds that you've seen, some recoveries, whatever you're allowed to say? Well, you know, there's so many different areas I've worked with where people have been able to manage their triggers in a healthy way. And whether it's the examples of people who can't get on a two-lane highway because they've been traumatized through car accidents or whether it's the little kid I talked about who couldn't be around dogs or listen to barking dogs without being traumatized or whether it's a person who has been physically abused in a primary relationship. Healing does happen. Healing does happen. And I see people who have not been able to be sexual with a uh, their married partner because of past sexual abuse go on to have fulfilling relationships, go on to be able to have children that they might not otherwise been able to have. Um, so, I mean, I see people heal a lot and I'm eminently hopeful. And sometimes when people are feeling hopeless, I I let people know that, you know, based on my experience, I am not feeling that hopelessness the way you are about what you're going through. Because I do believe that there is a way to get to a different place. That was going to be my next question. You kind of asked it yourself. Um, have you ever had someone walk through your door and you can see a better future for them than they can see for themselves? All the time. Yeah. Does that, it must feel good, but at the same time, you know, they're not feeling it right now. Right. So Part of it has, has to, go. to come incrementally. Yeah. So you can see the steps from the despair to, um, I hate to say, I mean, I guess we'll, we'll just reach for the stars. Maybe self-actualization, like this person is living the life they should. They feel empowered. They're achieving the things they want to. Their potential isn't going to waste, um, getting wasted on some addiction, right? Uh -huh. um, they're not going to, you know, hopefully die earlier than they should have. Um, from all the different things that come with PTSD and, and eating disorders and addiction, this estuary is very dark, um, but you've seen people swim out of it. Yes, I, you know, and people, it's not, it's not necessarily, I'm always the one involved in that, but people will come to me and they'll say, I'm 30 years sober, and I say, wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Right. And, and maybe something's happened to them that, that has put them in a place where they feel their life is not empowered, mm. they're feeling powerless over something, and, and I'll have them go back to the fact that they are 30 years sober, mm -hmm. and it, coming from a place that felt so hopeless and desperate, and like they were powerless over this addiction, and they went from a place to that, to being effectively managing that in their life, and what a difference that has made. That's a, just a simple example. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring it around to eating disorders for a second because that's a big focus for us. Um, the physicality of the work and how exhausting it can be is something that I saw 
you know, um, with, with Cal. And then also she was looking up online, is this normal or is there something wrong with me? Is it because I don't eat enough or this or that? Um, for people struggling with uh, restrictive eating disorders or anything where they may be malnourished, um, is there a, a recommendation that their physical health be at some kind of sustainable baseline before they get into work like this? It's kind of a chicken egg thing, isn't it? It is. It's a little like the question that I'm often asked, does somebody have to be sober in order to do EMDR therapy? And how do they get sober if their mind isn't healthy? And it exactly, goes, it's exactly. So, hard. so <clears throat> I think the answer to which comes first is both. Hmm. So you wouldn't tell people to stay away if they're like, we never, I never list calories or pounds or anything like that, but if they're still like dangerous, dangerously restricting, but they're not in a hospital, you wouldn't close the door? No, I wouldn't. And I actually, uh, probably more than many therapists, I routinely ask what people ate and drank the day before they came to see me. You do? And whether it's the first time or whether it's throughout the therapy, at different juncture points because I believe so much in the importance of maintaining blood sugar in just as a basic element of health and well-being. I mean just that simple thing of maintaining proper blood sugar affects mood, it affects cognitive functioning, it affects one's need for sleep or not, it, af it affects how a person experiences a sense of hopefulness or joy. I mean, there's just that one simple thing. So hmm. it's common for me to just say, and you know, I don't tell people about diets. I don't work on any of that stuff. I just say, what did you eat and drink yesterday? And are you open to me making some suggestions that I think might help you in terms of this particular issue, which they're coming to me for? Mm -hmm. So I figure if they're coming to me for a particular issue and how they approach eating and drinking affects that issue, I feel like I perhaps have a buy-in to comment on it or to at least check on it. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're part of a group of people that are you know, trying to help take responsibility for their well-being until they can do it themselves, right? So it must feel some sense of, I have a right to, to speak on this, right? Well, I... I I think it's an important element of checking in with a person to know what their current state is in mm -hmm. order to know how to move forward. Have you ever just had to turn a session into something other than the full EMDR eye movements and everything because someone came in and said, I, ha I haven't eaten in two days? And you just have to kind of just say, okay, well, we're not going to do the most, the most difficult trauma work, but we can maybe do something else and see, you almost go into triage mode, right? This person needs food. Yeah, I mean, I, I have on occasion, if I knew somebody hadn't eaten and they were hungry, I, I might look and see if I have a stash of protein bars or something, you know, just something, especially if they're diabetic, or, you know, mm. I wanna make sure that they're, so yeah, I mean, you vary it based on the, the client that comes in. Can you talk a little bit more about nutrition and brain function? Well, it affects all of that, and especially uh, one's capacity to learn and retain information is affected by it. Hmm. So f that's why these children's nutritional programs are so important in schools. Free breakfast for kids. For kids. Yeah, yeah, for kids who can't otherwise afford that. Um, having proper nutrition really affects how a pro child is able to learn and retain information. Does it help you wake up faster? Because I, uh, when I say wake up, I don't mean from sleeping. I mean from, hang on, it's morning, don't ask me questions, to like, okay, it's 10.30, I can concentrate, I can answer that tough question at work or whatever about those 10,000 emails. Because I have a hard time eating before like 8.30 or 9, I just, my stomach is not ready. And I wonder if that's because I stay a little bit groggy and if that's like, it keeps the wolves at bay. Well, you'll Does have eating to wake you up. You'll have to do a little experiment <laughs> you on yourself. Test it on myself. You run this that experiment all... and let she's, me know the results. She's making me follow up. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'll have to put that on our Instagram. I've been eating an apple in the morning, and it seems to be just the right amount. You know, okay. it's just a little sweet. It's a little energy, but at the same time, waking up without Cal every day, I don't love feeling more alert. There's a part of me that likes that numbness, you uh -huh. know? And so I wonder with other people who have lifelong trauma, not just a specific loss, um, um, 
especially something unnatural, because as, as horrific as it is to lose a loved one, you can still trace it to something in nature, right? Mortality. Mm -hmm. So, but then there's like sexual assault. So then the question is, how alert do you really want to be in this life? And it's like, you know, it kind of so reminds not me. Not much. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the caribou commercial, you know. Stay awake for it? Yeah. 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 When people wear, wear, wear t-shirts that say, be present, I feel yeah. like my t-shirt is, think about something else. Yeah. Because it is more of a, like, let me just survive this. Yeah. Okay, what I love has been taken from me. Um, let me just get through the day. The well, day being the lifetime. I think you're describing a grieving process and... Certainly people's sleeping and eating patterns can change during gr acute grief. Mm. So. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so where were we on the EMDR? So someone's had, you said for, for people with long-term uh, trauma from their early childhood, it can be many more sessions. Are there people who do this for years and maybe they just yeah. take a much slower time with it? Yeah, there are people who will actually take a year or more to just get to a place where they can be able to do calm place, where they are able to have enough of those stabilization skills sets that they would be in a place to do the trauma work. Because if you can't keep in the window of tolerance, there's a chance you can re-traumatize a person through doing the trauma work. So we want to be kind and gentle in the process. We do not want to do that. If anything, we want to err on the side of going slower. Mm -hmm. EMDR can, is powerful. It's, it's very effective. And a lot of things can happen rapidly, but not all. And so you walk into it and until you know what you're dealing with, you don't know if this is going to be one to three sessions or if it's going to take a long time to establish a rapport and to reach a point where there's enough capacity to do stabilization and to stay in that window of tolerance that you can safely move ahead on processing. Mm -hmm. Do you typically do sessions once a week or with people who have more extreme situations, do you try to maybe bring in, uh, I guess, have less time between sessions in case of those really difficult, you know, things that do get drudged up? It varies per client. If somebody comes in to me and says they had a car accident and they drive for work and they haven't been able to go to work since the car accident, I'm going to up it. Mm. I typically see people once a week, once every other week. Uh, the once every other weeks are often people that are referred to me specific for the MDR work and they have other primary therapists. I like them to stay in touch and be active with their primary therapist mm -hmm. uh, while they're doing work with me. Um, I also, with two associates, pioneered the work on using uh, multiple hours of EMDR in a single week to see whether or not that was helpful. Uh, bef many years ago it was thought that you have to give a, lo a lot of time in between sessions or you shouldn't... Recovery? You should, yeah, mm. that people need recovery time and and so it was you know encouraged to maybe do a process session in between EMDR sessions and then uh, a colleague of mine and, well, a couple of colleagues of mine were involved in uh, treating people after Katrina. And I was brought into the research on that. Um, they did pre and post tests, and because it was an acute situation, they did six hours of therapy a week, two hour sessions, three times a week, wow. and did pre and post tests, uh, pre and post tests. And so I was involved in the research on that, and I subsequently, with them, presented that at the annual uh, EMDR conference. And we showed that on all measures, uh, there was significant symptom reduction. So that then showed that you could safely do multiple hours or multiple sessions mm -hmm. with a person in a given week. So, um, and it really depends on how you work with your client to make sure they're, they're in the window of tolerance and they have proper assessment and proper strategies for that stabilization that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Once you have that and you can see that, you can do multiple sessions. I have colleagues that have not wanted to go to people locally because they're too well known. 
Uh, they yeah. want the privacy who will actually fly to other cities and they will do intensive EMDR sessions with a therapist in a different city. They'll stay at a hotel and they will do maybe three to six hours with breaks uh, over a period of days to complete an important piece of work and then come back. So most people I see, uh, I do, I would see once a week, but there are occasions where time is of the essence. Oh, I have to do it more, like somebody who is, I work a lot with medical traumas, and if somebody has a medical trauma and they're due to have surgery and they need to have an MRI beforehand and they panic and they can't do the MRI, I'm going to increase the sessions so they get to a place where they can have the surgery. Yeah, if there's a specific life event you have to be, have to be functional for and be able to deal with it, that makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. When you talked earlier about consolidating memories, that was interesting. That's a phrase I haven't thought of before. Like, if I think of the most difficult things I've dealt with in life, I guess I never thought about where the memory is stored in my head and how I'm, how I'm thinking about it. I think about reframing a lot. Like, mm -hmm. think about this in a larger context of something good, and then the bad doesn't look as bad, or think about less Western and, you know, more of a dialectic type of approach. I would never thought about consolidation of memories. Um, can you get a little bit deeper into what that meant? Consolidation of memory means that memory gets stored in a narrative form or that it gets stored in a way that it is not presenting activation as though you're re-experiencing the memory now that happened some time ago. Okay. So you still know, so let's say you've had an experience of a traumatic incident when the memory isn't consolidated, you're going to have most likely intrusive thoughts. You might have nightmares. You might have triggers that once you're triggered about this event, cause you to have uh, somatic symptoms such as heart palpitations, such as breathing heavy, sweating, turning red, feeling a panic attack coming on. That is a sign that the memory is not consolidated. In other words, it is still located in the part of your brain that's the, the subcortical area where you would experience it more in the form of emotions and body sensations. Once a memory is consolidated, you see a deactivation of that. So you're not going to get that, that rapid breathing when you think about the memory. You're not going to get that emotional angst or whatever is associated with that traumatic event. You're still going to know it occurred, but it's good. I explain it to people. It's a little like your experience is like a photograph that you store in a photo album that you put in a box and you store in the back shelf of a closet. You go by, you know, it's there, but mm -hmm. it's not screaming at you. It's not in your face and it's not being brought into your daily life. So what is the purpose? Uh, I guess I'm trying to think like in terms of biological or evolutionary biology, what is the purpose of that state of mind where you trip over something again and again and again? Is it, I guess I'm picturing if, you know, if there's a, we talked about the snake in the woods. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so that, you know to be afraid of that so that if you see a snake, you step away from it. So yeah. I guess there's a purpose to fear. But when you see someone you love and you know they've been struggling for decades with something that you can't do anything about it, it happened ages ago, and it just still owns them, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a heartbreaking thing to see, and you start to wonder intellectually, like, what, what purpose is this horror serving in this person's life? Why doesn't the mind naturally... Um, why, why don't we heal better from trauma without having to go out and find all this help, you know? It's just, it's such a difficult thing. I guess there's got to be some kind of a, um, like an evolutionary purpose to, the, to that fear response in the amygdala and all that that we were talking about. Well, the evolutionary person purpose of that is to help us manage dangerous situations. And the thing is with trauma, uh, it just gets locked in. So instead of coming on board when we need it, it's kind of omnipresent and it's a, it creates an activation that occurs way past the point where it's at all useful. And so in a way it gets stuck. It's like it's unmetabolized. That's one way to think about it. It's not properly digested. 
Mm. So I often use food equations when I'm explaining things. Mm -hmm. It's like if you give a starving person a steak, there's probably going to be some cramping. There's going to be some discomfort uh, because that would overwhelm the person's digestive system at that point, just like trauma overwhelms the brain at the point that it occurs in terms of those parts of the brain that that uh, PTSD symptoms show up in which again are the emotional centers and the physical sensation centers of the brain. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. It sounds so simple and clear when it's explained clinically, you know, but then you've seen how difficult the work can be and how for some people it is years of their life trying to um, just get not the sense of that everything's always okay, but that they can function, that they can, I always think about, you know, living out their potential, doing what, what they're able to do and not being held back from their own achievements in life. Yeah. Yeah, that's always that's always so hard, isn't it? Mm. Whether it's addiction or trauma or any anything else. I mean, yeah. you know, even physical illness. Mm -hmm. it, it it's it's part of the human condition, but it's also very um, tragic. Absolutely, we talked earlier about addiction and and people being labeled as having died of a heart attack, and I pictured just about every musician that died in the '60s. I think I think like on Jim Morrison's death certificate, I think they put heart attack, and I think they did it for a lot of them. But you know, would there be probably the more famous or the more rich you are, the more likely the the hmm. actual diagnosis of your death does not get stated if it's involving an overdose. Interesting. Just a thought. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting point. You'd think there'd be some place where social status doesn't have an effect on on science, but we're we're social creatures at the end of the day, I guess. Um, so many more questions. We've hit, we've gone past an hour. Do you have a few more minutes? Just a few. Okay. I always like to ask people about the healing power of. Uh, of creativity and art because we're a you know an organization based on a musician can you talk a little bit more about um, how you've seen art and creativity as a positive force in people's lives well I I have used art uh, I have had some training and background in art it was part of a double major I was one class short of a art major Oh wow! but I have used uh, and taught art therapy to inner city kids and I have taught uh, through the Joslyn Art Museum, children's art. That's a, so I'm big on art, and actually with EMDR therapy, I use art a lot because depending on the age of the child, they may not be able to put things into coherent statements, but they can draw. So I can have children draw what happened. I can have them draw their family, and I can learn so much about their connections with each family member. And it has been a powerful intervention tool to help in the diagnosis and treatment of children, especially. But on, on a more general scale, I think of art and music as being the bomb. That's B A L M. Yeah, <laughs> the, not the bomb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, it's like yeah. It's, it's like what energizes us. It's what relaxes us. It can be used in so many different ways as a self-soothing technique, but it can also be used to energize a person. So where would we be without our art? Where would we be without our music? Mm. Where would be we be without the creative types in this world? Yep, absolutely. Well, that's what we're all about at we the would Carnegie be, Foundation. We would be the poorer for it. For, for sure. For sure we would. So I'm going to ask you one last question and then I'll let you get back to your practice. In the trenches here, um, when you talk about people recovering with EMDR, um, it makes me wonder if they build, if this has even been studied, if they build a stronger tolerance for future trauma because they've got that better, you know, more filled out toolbox now? Absolutely they really? do. And the, the answer is absolutely. So and that's been researched? Yes. And the reason for that is you, uh, you strengthen that resilience within a person by doing the work. So one of the things we know is that if you have a single trauma, it takes you a certain amount of time to get back into your window of tolerance. If you have a second trauma, you get back into the window of tolerance, but you're a little higher up. With that third trauma, you, your resting state is actually higher. And pretty soon with multiple traumas, the, you go as you settle in, you're outside the window of tolerance itself. So 
by intervening on that, by processing the earlier traumas, you then build up strength because you are able to allow people or people are able to experience getting back into the actual window of tolerance rather than being outside of it when, even when their trauma settles in a bit. Mm. You follow that? Yeah. The window of tolerance thing I'm trying to keep up on. I understand being too high. Yeah. What does the too low part mean? Walk me through that again. Well, when you're too low, you can get uh, sleepy. So, for example, some people will say that they sleep 13 hours a day, 15 hours a day. That can be one form of it. Vegetative depression can be another form of it. Okay, that was the activation thing we were talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the numbing. Yeah. So that's where you see it a lot with eating disorders. You, you see people on the lower side where they've dropped out of the window of tolerance because food is being used to numb. Mm-hmm. For sure. Well, I will leave the last comments to you. I'm honored that you've given me this time, especially out of the blue on a cold call. I appreciate it. We didn't know each other through anyone uh, really in my network. You're kind of, I think, three degrees separated from someone I originally asked to help connect me with psychologists and folks. So thank you so much for your time. Anything else you want to share with uh, survivors out there listening, maybe people wondering, um, should I even go out and get help or should I mention this to a friend or anything? Final comments, it's all yours. Well, I believe in human beings' capacity to heal and over a broad spectrum of people, events, life experiences, and time, I only have come to believe that stronger. So I'll leave you with that. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully this hasn't been too painful. <laughs> For who?